After World War II, the U.S. government was faced with a question. How can you advance your country's interests abroad without causing armed conflict and mass casualties? Looked at one way, this almost sounds like a call for global peace. But the U.S. government's answer was a little more nefarious than that. By the start of the Cold War, the U.S. had a persuasive way to back up its words. The threat of the atomic bomb. But although such a weapon is incredibly powerful, it's hardly practical for day-to-day -day negotiations. The U.S. needed a more effective way to encourage world leaders to promote U.S. commercial interests without risking more bloodshed. So it added a new tool to its arsenal. Economic hitmen. What is the job of an economic hitman? But my job was to identify countries with resources our corporations wanted, like oil, in Iran, for example. And then in, in most of these countries, arrange huge loans to that country. Now, Iran was an exception there. They didn't need loans. We just wanted their oil. That's another story. But in general, it was to arrange a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sister organizations. But the money never actually went to the country. Instead, it went to our own corporations in the United States to build big infrastructure projects in the country. When countries owe money, the U.S. can count on their loyalty. And that also benefits large U.S. corporations and their wealthy investors. With their doctored financial reports, EHMs convinced leaders that the programs they pushed would help the local economy flourish. If the leader wasn't aligned with U.S. interests or was unwilling to cooperate, EHMs would help instigate coups followed by elections rigged to ensure a more agreeable replacement took over. EHMs also made use of extortion, threats, and whatever else was necessary to achieve U.S. political, economic, and military goals. But in 1953, a CIA agent named Kermit Roosevelt organized a coup in Iran. The goal was to regain unrestricted access to Iran's oil reserves. While the coup was successful, the U.S. realized it was playing a dangerous game. People like Roosevelt, who were organizing coups and pressuring leaders through debt, were representatives of the U.S. government. If they were found out, it would be a big problem. The solution? Funnel money to private sector companies, who would then hire and manage teams of EHMs around the world. If efforts went awry, they could only be traced back to these private corporations, and not the CIA or U.S. military. Ready to finish his business administration degree at Boston University, the 23-year-old Perkins was looking for adventure in his life, and for a way to avoid the Vietnam War draft. He soon found a way to tick both boxes, turning down the offer of a desk job at the National Security Agency in favor of a more enticing opportunity, volunteering with the Peace Corps in the Ecuadorian Amazon. Partway through his stint, he received an unlikely visitor, a man named Einar Grieve. Grieve was vice president of Chast T. Maine Incorporated, or Maine, an international engineering consultancy. He needed someone who knew the country, someone he could trust. Maine needed to assure its client, the World Bank, that it would be a wise investment to loan billions of dollars to Ecuador and its neighbors to fund some much-needed hydroelectric dams. Grieve asked Perkins to help. In business school, I was taught that, and the economic models show it, that if you invest a large amount of money in infrastructure, the GDP, the gross domestic product, grows. It does. And so all the models tell you this is the way to help a country. But over time, as I was in this job for 10 years, and perhaps because I'd been in the Peace Corps, I began to understand that actually it wasn't that the poor people weren't getting any better off and the middle classes were getting poorer, actually. It was just a few rich families that were making a lot of money. Over the following year, Perkins sent Grieve frequent reports analyzing Ecuador's economy. When he returned to Boston in 1971, Grieve offered him a job as an economic forecaster for Maine. Over time, Perkins noticed that while Maine was an engineering company, it didn't actually build anything. Instead, it played the middleman between governments and private companies. Over the next 10 years, Perkins wrote economic reports similar to those he'd written when he was in Ecuador. 
His job was to make massive loans seem like a good idea. Loans that would leave countries deep in debt and vulnerable to U.S. influence. For example, Perkins spun data to convince Indonesia's leaders to accept billion-dollar loans for infrastructure projects and oil extraction. As was standard, the terms of the loans required them to hire American contractors, like Maine. Maine didn't receive money from the U.S. government directly, but it didn't need to. The terms of the loans guaranteed the company would get rich. In 1973, Perkins negotiated U.S. access to Saudi Arabia's oil reserves, brokering large-scale modernization of the country's infrastructure in return. Over the years, he witnessed coups, assassinations, money laundering, and corruption, all as a result of his EHM activities. He quit Maine in 1980. But America's use of EHMs around the world was just getting started. By the mid-2000s, Ecuador had seen eight different presidents in a decade. Each was toppled or assassinated and replaced with someone who prioritized U.S. interests. But in 2006, a promising new presidential candidate named Rafael Correa emerged. Correa vowed to take back control of Ecuador's natural resources. This and other of his campaign pledges proved immensely popular. He won 60% of the vote, and after taking office, he began following through. But there was one problem. His administration had inherited vast debts which would take years to pay off. If Correa wanted to continue tackling his bold agenda, he needed to make some difficult concessions. Correa knew what he was up against. He'd already been approached by EHMs, too, and was poised to resist their demands. So when the International Monetary Fund told Correa that the only way out was to sell all of the petroleum under the Amazon rainforest to the hungry oil companies waiting in the wings, he refused to pay up. But then Correa went a step too far. He tried to renegotiate national oil contracts, which stipulated that Ecuador didn't actually own any of its oil and was only entitled to a share of the profits. When the EHMs failed to change his mind, they tried to oust him like the previous eight presidents. In 2010, the Ecuadorian police, organized by EHMs and likely with help from the CIA, staged a coup. In South America, the president of Ecuador is safe this morning after being rescued by the army from protesting police. Hundreds of angry officers surrounded a hospital where the president was being treated for a tear gas attack. The military defended Correa, who survived and remained in office. Correa later made an appearance on the balcony of the presidential palace, telling cheering supporters the violence was more than a police protest, calling it an attempted coup. But he found himself in a tight spot. If he acted too aggressively, he could still be replaced with another puppet. As a result, Correa's policy decisions in the years to follow weren't as revolutionary as his campaign had led voters to expect. What made the work of EHMs possible was corporatocracy, networks connecting corporations, banks, and governments. It was a powerful vehicle for corruption, and while it began in America, its tendrils gradually achieved global reach. This wasn't something that the average person was aware of. The influence of corporatocracy remained largely in the shadows, but in 2015, a scandal brought it into the light. Partly. That year, the U.S. Justice Department charged officials of FIFA, the international governing body of soccer, with a smorgasbord of corruption allegations. They corrupted the business of worldwide soccer to serve their interests and to enrich themselves. These included taking bribes, money laundering, and fraud, all of which were tools in the EHM repertoire. Football's governing body is trying to tackle its shady inner workings by suspending two executives on corruption charges. The FIFA scandal rumbles on. Jack Warner, who was at the centre of bribery accusations, has resigned as vice president. There's been so many corruption scandals that FIFA have had to deal with. Bribery and FIFA go together like peanut butter and jelly. On the surface, the guilty pleas of FIFA officials represented a big victory for anti-corruption efforts. But while the defendants forfeited sums in the millions and a spotlight shone on their misdeeds, 
another, far larger scandal remained in the dark. As early as 2007, Barclays, Citigroup, J.P. Morgan Chase, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and UBS of Switzerland formed what some members called the cartel. The goal? To load their coffers through market manipulation. Through emails and secret chat rooms with names like the Mafia, these bankers coordinated in rigging the price of currencies on the foreign exchange market. In 2014, they got caught. The banks pleaded guilty and were fined nearly $6 billion, a lot of money for the average person. But for these banks, whose assets were in the hundreds of billions, it was a drop in the bucket. Nobody was arrested. So why was it so easy to follow the play-by-play -play of the FIFA scandal, even though the settlement was pennies on the dollar to the Forex lawsuits? There must have been a reason these banks' cartel schemes were allowed to go on for so long. Banks are part of the corporatocracy, and so can depend on lobbyists to influence the Justice Department. They have enough money and power to buy off elected officials and ensure that they don't get overregulated. FIFA, on the other hand, isn't part of this club. So when both scandals surfaced within months of each other, it was clear which case would get more airtime. The Forex bankers walked away free, while FIFA officials were handcuffed for the world to see. The Forex scandal is only the tip of the corporatocratic iceberg when it comes to corporate EHMs influencing law and order. The number and variety of EHMs have grown since Perkins' time, and today, many large corporations in the United States use them to achieve their goals. At home and abroad, EHMs have helped make wealthy people and businesses richer and the rest of the world poorer. As global inequality continues to worsen, private banks have begun hiring EHMs too. And $100 billion corporations rely on EHMs to vouch for tax cuts in Washington. You're probably familiar with Boeing as an aircraft manufacturer, but the company also produces weapons. In fact, it's one of the three largest defense contractors in the world. Boeing employs a special breed of EHMs called Site Location Consultants, whose job is to pressure communities into granting Boeing tax breaks and loosening environmental regulations. If local and state governments don't meet their demands, Boeing threatens to take its business, and thousands of jobs, elsewhere. Boeing's consultants are rewarded handsomely, earning as much as 30% of the government subsidies they secure. Other household names receive substantial corporate welfare thanks to these site location consultants and other new types of EHM. From 2000 to 2015, the U.S. government gave subsidies of $60 million or more to 298 corporations, including Goldman Sachs and Monsanto. ExxonMobil, which made $41 billion in profit in 2011, received $119 million in state subsidies. Perhaps most striking is Walmart. A report by Americans for Tax Fairness found that this popular supermarket chain avoids paying billions in U.S. taxes by storing its assets, some $76 billion, in 15 overseas tax havens. Such a maneuver would be near impossible without the help of EHM methods. How come Walmart is able to sell everything so cheap? It's simple economics, son. I don't understand it at all. But God, I love it. But as profits have increased, Wages have remained low. Walmart employees rely on $6 billion a year in subsidized health care, public nutrition, and housing assistance programs. My job is a cashier and self-checkout host. My hourly wage is $11.55. I can't live off of $11.55. Last year, I got an apartment. I was only able to keep the apartment for about three months because I couldn't afford the rent, I couldn't afford the utilities. The only thing I could do was move back in with my mother and father. More people at Walmart get food stamps, rental assistance, Medicaid, and Medicare than work at any other corporation in America. A lot of them have two, two maybe three jobs. People who do get health insurance through Walmart, it's very expensive and the premiums are very high. I mean, most associates don't even have money at the end of the payday. They have to pay their rent or rather they have to pay for other things. The owners of Walmart, the Walton family, 
are some of the richest people on the planet. And yet, it's never enough. They still rely on EHMs to increase their fortune at the expense of others. The U.S. isn't alone in its use of EHMs. You might remember that after Ecuador's former president Rafael Correa took office, he refused to pay the millions of dollars in debt he'd inherited from past presidents. Consequently, Ecuador's credit rating plummeted. Correa approached Beijing, and China was only too happy to help, providing a $2 billion loan. Once Ecuador repaid these loans, its global credit standing was reinstated. But in the process, the country also became vulnerable to China and its own version of EHMs. By 2015, Ecuador was selling 55% of its oil to China and none to the U.S. Since the 90s, China has been taking notes on U.S. foreign policy tactics. With the help of its EHMs, China has relied on many of the same strategies, such as debt and fear, to increase its wealth and power. China appears to have learned from some of Washington's early mistakes. When offering loans, instead of pushing free trade agreements, it assures countries that its factories will be around for the long term. Unlike World Bank loans, which often come with a series of strict conditional requirements, China also doesn't appear to tack on such demands. But regardless of its improvements to the EHM system, the basis remains the same exploit developing countries through debt and use that to accumulate capital and influence. Just as many countries fear the U.S., there's frequent talk within the U.S. of fearing China, its influence, and even its contributions to industrial pollution. American politicians and talking heads often repeat the question, how can we stop China? This is misguided, as the U.S. and China are more closely intertwined than we might assume. For instance, much of the pollution China produces is for goods exported to the U.S. Chinese pollution is U.S. pollution. People living in the United States make up 5% of the world population, yet consume 25% of the world's resources. China, whose citizens constitute 19% of the world's population, is trying to imitate this wasteful model. As other countries join in, it becomes clear that everyone, from the U.S. to China, Brazil to India, has to participate in a more sustainable system. So instead of stopping China, we should focus on changing our mindsets and the way we consume products and information. <laughs> 